When you hear a YouTuber begin to talk about Disney Park's failures, there's usually a villainous name attached to those projects. Michael Eisner. The man's name has been dragged through the mud on the internet for projects like Euro Disneyland, the original Disney's California Adventure Park, and the lackluster Hong Kong Disneyland. But surprisingly, without Michael Eisner, the Walt Disney Company would likely not exist as it does today. He saved Disney from financial ruin and turned around the business creatively. But his efforts during this time are seemingly forgotten. As he never left a hero, he pursued long enough to become a villain. So today, let's talk about Michael Deman Eisner and why we have him to thank for the Disney company still being around today. For review time, I'm Luke. And this is the truth about Michael Eisner, the hated man who saved the Disney company. Following the death of founder Walt Disney in 1966 and his brother Roy O. Disney in 1971, the Walt Disney Company narrowly survived. A company that had been an iconic part of America for the last few decades was struggling to even create one hit film with over 70% of the company's revenue at the time coming from the theme parks. In the early 1980s, a hostile takeover of Disney was attempted by businessman Sol Steinberg, who wanted to buy up the company just to split it off and make a profit. If this went through, it would have meant that things like Disney's theme parks would have no longer been owned by them. Disney was on the verge of catastrophic failure and their savior would come in the form of a six foot three man who is currently the chief operating officer of Paramount Pictures. Eisner had made a name for himself as a creative powerhouse who was successful with hit film after hit film in his time at Paramount. He oversaw films such as Grease, Saturday Night Fever, Raiders of the Lost Ark and more. Disney shareholders, including Walt's nephew, Roy E. Disney, thought Eisner would be the perfect pick and brought him on board as CEO and chairman. His right-hand man would be Frank Wells, a former Warner Brothers chief stepping in as president. Eisner's first impressions on the company were interesting when he genuinely asked Walt's daughter, Diane Miller, if Walt was actually frozen. Eisner signed a deal that at the time looked to be fair, but would turn out to be incredibly lucrative for him. He would make $750,000 a year, plus a 2% bonus of any profit Disney made over 100 million, the most Disney had ever made in a single year. He was also offered the option to buy up to 510,000 shares at any point in his tenure for the then current market price of $57 each. On September 22, 1984, it was official. Michael Eisner was in charge of Disney. The instincts of Eisner and Wells being the perfect duo soon turned out to be entirely correct. The pair settled into a comfortable working relationship that allowed Eisner to oversee the creative aspects of the company, while Wells would focus on the admin and financial parts. The big grandiose changes at the top of Disney made an immediate impression on Wall Street. Just a month into Eisner's tenure, Disney's stock had surged, meaning on paper if he was to activate his stock options, he'd already made $3 million. Within the first three years of his leadership, operating income at the company had jumped from under $300 million to nearly $800 million. This caused Disney's share price to soar, which made the hastily negotiated contract Eisner signed insanely lucrative. In 1988, he was paid his salary of $750,000, a bonus of $6.8 million, thanks to the 2% of profits over $100 million clause, and earned $32.6 million more by exercising some of his stock options, totaling just over $40 million, which made him the highest paid executive in America. But how did he do it? Let's take a look at some of the iconic Eisner projects of the time and see just how he was able to not just save a floundering business, but help it soar. 
With both Eisner and Wells coming from film backgrounds, it made sense that some of their first big successes were in movies. Down and Out in Beverly Hills was the first major release of their regime, and both audiences and critics alike loved it. In the end, it made a more than respectable $62 million at the box office, becoming Disney's most successful live-action feature ever. While other film production companies were making mega expensive blockbusters, Disney saw success in lower budget films with smaller name stars that ultimately led to much higher profit margins. In just four years, Disney went from struggling to make a profit on movies to the number one film studio at the box office. With countless successes in Eisner's early years, including Who Framed Roger Rabbit, Three Men and a Baby, and Good Morning Vietnam. In 1988 alone, Disney released Honey, I Shrunk the Kids, which made $222 million, Dead Poet Society, which made $236 million, as well as a little movie called The Little Mermaid. Of course, you can't talk about the successes of Michael Eisner without talking about the renaissance of Disney animation. In the years preceding Eisner, Disney animated films had been at best mild successes and at worst, outright flops. Animation used to be the company's bread and butter, but now making a new animated film was a huge risk. Disney had been toying around with an adaptation of Hans Christian Andersen's book, The Little Mermaid, since the 1930s. To try and break the trends of recent Disney animated films, they decided to make a film that had a more Broadway feel to it, bringing on board Howard Ashman and Alan Menken to do the music, who had previously worked together on Little Shop of Horrors. The film was greenlit, but towards the middle of production, the movie was fastly approaching its $40 million budget, and Disney was reluctant to give them any more. Through clever cuts such as scaling back the number of colours used on Ariel from 11 to 7, which alone saved $750,000, Disney was able to create the film for that $40 million, which was well spent. As in the end, the film would go on to make over $222 million worldwide after it debuted in 1989. But the money wasn't as important as the legacy this film started. The renaissance of Disney animation was officially confirmed in March of 1990, when The Little Mermaid won two Oscars. Previously, Disney animators had worked on a schedule of once every four years for their animated films. Thanks to the success of Mermaid though, Eisner insisted he now wanted one every 12 to 18 months. Two years later, they would see another smash hit when Beauty and the Beast went on to make $332 million at the box office, making it the third highest grossing film of the year. Its success didn't stop there though, as it eventually went on to sell over 22 million VHS copies and was also the first animated film to ever be nominated for Best Picture at the Oscars. It eventually went on to win two Academy Awards, one for Best Original Song and one for Best Original Score. Over the next 10 years, Disney would release an abundance of films that have gone down in history as some of the greatest animated features of all time, including Aladdin, Pocahontas, Hercules, Mulan, and The Hunchback of Notre Dame, with each easily recouping its production costs, with The Lion King especially being praised for its money-making. When one Wall Street analyst called the film the most profitable picture in the history of Hollywood, thanks to its abundance of toys, merchandise, and product tie-ins. Eisner, though, didn't want to just be a quiet CEO behind the scenes. He wanted himself to become the face of the company. A few years into Eisner's reign, he moved to revive Disney's long-running Sunday night program that, until being cancelled the year before his arrival, had run continuously for 29 years. Walt Disney had seen the Sunday night show as his way to talk directly to the public, and Eisner thought this new version of the show also needed a human host. Eisner would consider Julie Andrews, Dick Van Dyke, Cary Grant, and 
even Tom Hanks for the role before turning them all down. When it became apparent to the other executives, Eisner was going to reject every single candidate except for one, himself. He approached Wells to say, I don't want to do it, but I guess I have to. He argued that the CEO needed to be front and center to show the world that Disney was no longer being run by the ghost of Walt. Others in the company finally understood it all. Eisner saw himself as Walt's heir and wanted to push himself to the public eye just as Walt had done all those years ago. The Disney Sunday movie hosted by Eisner was a modest success. Disney's most successful television project at the time though was their jump into Disney Afternoon on Fox, where two hours of animated children's programming would run, making Disney a cool $40 million a year. Another incredibly successful new idea implemented early in Eisner's tenure was that of the Disney Store, which brought the magic of Disney to people's backyards in ways that were never before seen unless you lived in Anaheim or Orlando. While initially Frank Wells didn't agree with this plan, Eisner pushed forward, saying, so what if it fails? It's not even gonna cost us as much as one movie script. The stores were a huge success right out of the gate, with sales per square foot setting records for specialty retailers. Disney stores saw rapid expansion with them popping up in every upscale retail area in the country and around the globe, reaching its peak in 2000 with 742 stores around the world. Another way Eisner was able to reframe the thinking of the Disney company and turn that into crazy profit was through the Disney vault. Disney was incredibly protective of their older films at the time, choosing to only re-release them theatrically in cinemas every few years. Disney was worried releasing the animated classics on an easy to access format would undermine their uniqueness by making them too accessible. Eisner and his team dismissed this worry, instead realizing that if they were to release Cinderella once every seven or so years in cinemas, they would generate $125 million over the next 28 years but selling VHS copies of Cinderella at $29.95 each would generate $100 million that year alone. Roy still wouldn't budge on Cinderella, saying it was too important for the brand, but did allow them to release Sleeping Beauty that year on VHS, which went on to sell 3 million units. The next year, Cinderella would be re-released both on VHS and in cinemas, selling over 6 million copies on VHS for $180 million, plus another $34 million for the cinema re-release. Home video sales soon became Disney's biggest profit center apart from the theme parks. This was the modernization of the Disney Vault, which previously saw them release the films every few years in cinema, but would now see Disney films released on home media in rotation every 10 or so years leading to a feeling of urgency in the consumer. Because if they didn't buy Pinocchio now, it would be years until they could buy it again. But now from VHS tapes to the stage, Disney had been toying with the idea of creating a Broadway show for a number of years. And when they finally did in 1994, it would be in a very Eisner way. The hit film Beauty and the Beast seemed to be a no brainer for a theatrical adaptation. And only a few years after the film would debut, the show would open, personally greenlit by Michael Eisner. Pushing away from the traditional Broadway processes of backers and producers, Disney simply financed the show entirely themselves. They also wouldn't bring the Broadway creative community on board, instead insisting the show's creative team was mostly made up of theme park theatrical cast members. On opening night, the audience gave the show a standing ovation. And the very next day, the Palace Theatre set a Broadway record by selling $700,000 worth of tickets in one day. When Eisner entered, the theme parks were already profitable, being the biggest money earner in the entire company. This wasn't enough for Eisner though, 
as he doubled down on aggressive theme park expansions, opening more parks in 12 years than Disney had done in the preceding 30. Eisner would in his tenure oversee the construction of Disney MGM Studios, Disney's Animal Kingdom, Disney's California Adventure, and more. Of course, it wasn't just new theme parks that he helped develop and greenlight. Some of Disney's most beloved and well-known attractions, such as Star Tours, Indiana Jones Adventure, and Splash Mountain, were all partially thanks to Eisner. But of all these projects, there was one that Eisner truly tried to make his own. And it was this same park that gave people a first glimpse at some weaknesses in Michael Eisner. Disney had been looking to expand their theme park footprint into Europe since 1966. But in 1985, just a year after Michael Eisner's move to the company, they finally signed an agreement with the French government to bring a park to France. Eisner was incredibly hands-on with the planning for this new park, eclipsing even his interest in the company's films. He would spend days in meetings with Imagineers, obsessing over the most minute details. Eisner loved the industry of theme parks, even though prior to Disney, he had pretty much no experience with them, saying, unlike producing movies, here we could be producer, director, editor, and even actors in every foot of the film. Designing theme parks was more exciting than anything you could do in film, where two dimensions were the rule. An example of Eisner's heavy-handed approach to the project was that he wanted to build the Disneyland Hotel over the park entrance. Designers warned it would obscure sightlines towards the castle. Frank Wells was worried that visitors would look up and see hotel guests in their underwear or even naked. Imagineers complained about the high cost of design and that there was no real need for another hotel, as they already had five in the plans. When a vote was taken of the group planning the park, it was 19 to 2 against building the hotel. Eisner's vote was one of those two, so it went ahead anyway. The cost to construct Euro Disneyland soared from estimates. Decisions such as making the castle out of real stone instead of molded fiberglass saw construction costs skyrocket. Originally budgeted at $1.3 billion, costs were approaching $2 billion, with industry insiders warning Disney they were heading for one of the biggest failures in construction they've ever seen. In the end, Euro Disneyland ultimately opened on April 22, 1992, at a total cost of $4 billion. This was one of the very first public mistakes Eisner had seemingly made, and it was a huge one. The European market was not going to be easily won over by Disney. Opening day, attendance was just 6,000 guests, around half of the expected number. Occupancy at the hotels was just 60%, far below the predicted 85%. A lot of the mistakes could be laid solely in Eisner's lap, as the overspending was mostly done at his behest. On Easter Sunday 1994, Michael and Jane Eisner were attending a dinner party hosted by their son, Breck. Five minutes into dinner, the phone rang. Breck passed the phone on to Michael who heard the voice of his secretary. Michael, Frank is dead. Eisner felt numb. All they knew was that he'd been killed in a helicopter crash, returning from skiing. One of the things he loved doing most in life. Wells' death was front page news the next day in the LA Times, and the focus for the Disney company became looking for a replacement. In the end, Eisner took the position of president and COO himself, and in the following years, the highs of his time at the company were all but forgotten, as the pillars he had built for the company started crumbling around him. Frank Wells was essentially Eisner's restraint, similar to how Roy and Walt Disney's relationship worked. Without Frank, things started to fall apart, and the next 10 years would see the man who brought Eisner on board be the same person who started a campaign to try and take him down. But the story of Michael Eisner vs Roy E. Disney and the Save Disney campaign is a big story for a different time. 
Of course, Eisner brought so much more to Disney than just what was talked about even in this video. Little things like the I'm going to Walt Disney World campaign were brought about by him, thanks to an ingenious idea from his wife. Today, it's easy to look at the latter years of Eisner's tenure and see failure after failure. But the deeper you look, the more you realize that so much of what makes Disney great today, we have Michael to thank for. Ultimately, without him, we might not even have a Disney company. So I, for one, would like to say thank you to Michael Eisner. During your time at Disney, you helped create some of my favorite films and some of the best Disney rides. Just don't think this means I've completely forgotten about 2001's Disney California Adventure. To a lot of people, Michael Eisner epitomized the idea of Disney magic. And speaking of magic, this week's video is sponsored by Magic Spoon. I'll be honest, I'm not a massive breakfast guy, but Magic Spoon to me has become that perfect after dinner treat without all the nasties normally contained in a dessert. In fact, Magic Spoon cereals have zero grams of sugar, 13 to 14 grams of protein, and only four net grams of carbs in each serving. And even better, I've only got 140 calories per serve. My personal favorite flavor is the cocoa variety that even does that cool little thing where it seeps into the milk, leaving you with that one final treat after you finish the bowl. Mm. Click the link below to grab a variety pack and try it today. And be sure to use the promo code TIME at checkout to get $5 off any order. Or go to magicspoon.com forward slash time. Magic Spoon is so confident in their product, it's backed with a 100% happiness guarantee. So if you don't like it for any reason, they'll refund your money, no questions asked. Once again, click the link below and use the code TIME for $5 off. Or go to magicspoon.com forward slash time to save $5 today. From the home of all things theme parks, I'm Luke for Review Time. Thanks for watching. We hope you enjoyed this week's episode of Review Time. If so, be sure to like and subscribe, and also check out our podcast, Review Time's Theme Park Cast, available on your podcasting platform of choice.